We're talking about higher entities today. It's your new film. Um, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself first? Uh, if you want, just look at the camera. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so I'll just say, uh, you know, just give us a little rundown of who you are and what you do, and then we can, you know, talk about All right, what cool. the film is. My name is Justin Fall, and uh, my background is in film production. Uh, I'm a film student from the Art Institute of Atlanta, and I'm also a uh, a career researcher that's my my ministry is my career like I my, my main focus in life is to be able to wake up the church I want to be able to better equip the church and I want them to understand that the times they're gonna be coming upon the face of this earth which we are approaching uh, no one would deny that crazy prophecies are being fulfilled right now things that a hundred years ago the average Christian would not have understood the scripture the way that they would today based on the unfolding of events that we're seeing. And so as a career researcher, the, you know, my ministry is all about equipping the saints for the last days, equipping the tribulation saints, even if you want to use that language, uh, but also to join the conversation of the world. I think that Christians need to be able to join the conversation about the paranormal, about the crazy topics. We need to join that conversation and give a biblical answer that will cause the world to want to draw near unto Christ. I think what's happening is uh, people are having experiences. And, and this is so major when you consider that an experience, one simple experience in an individual's life can change the course of their life. I mean, they have one supernatural experience and it can change everything. And so as a Christian, we, we see what the Bible teaches, but the world doesn't have that foundation. And so when they have a supernatural or a paranormal experience they're now going to go down a different direction and i believe it's a toxic direction so much that people are having these experiences and they're wanting to get answers and so they're getting the wrong answers from the wrong people and they're now wanting to communicate with said entities you know the the, the ufos there i heard a story just the other day a dear friend of mine had a family member living in hawaii and his whole religion was it was not anything written in a book his religion was based on his experience and his experience was to walk out on the beach sometimes uh, using psychedelics and he would just stand with his feet in the water in hawaii and he would be communicated with by alien entities and the the friend of mine who told me the story he's a he's a born again christian he's firm in his faith he's very much awake to the deceptions of the enemy uh, but he shared this with me and he said that these experiences have changed this man's life because you can't tell him a that those experiences weren't real or b that those experiences were evil this is what's happening in the church today with the hyper charismatic movement they are having experiences and they're told that this is the Holy Spirit. Wow, well, what do you think it is? I believe that we are entertaining uh, all types of spirits around us. If you could just see into the spirit realm, uh, even in the most public place, at the, at the shopping mall, at the, at the restaurant, if you could just peer behind the veil, I personally believe you would see all types of spirits and they're all operating you know, differently. A familiar spirit is familiar with the person that it's going after. You know, they know where you eat, where you sleep, where you live. And uh, as a Christian, those familiar spirits are going to want to come towards you and to tempt you where they can. I made a statement uh, on the SGT report uh, recently that spiritual warfare is changing. It looks different now than it might have looked 50 years ago. Absolutely. And it even changes in, in my life. From my first year of being a Christian, the, the attacks were different. They look different. The, the, the demons were hitting me in a different place than they're trying to hit me now. Uh, having been walking with the Lord uh, since I was 21, I'm, I'm almost 37 now. And so the attacks are different. They look different. They feel different. And they are, I don't want to use new age language, but it's almost like they're on a different frequency. Hmm. So do you believe that uh, the other side is adapting to the modern consciousness of people that uh, how everybody's changing and with technology and smartphones? Do you think that they're using that? I think they're using that, but I think it's more on a personal level. So, for instance, the things that you were weaker with as a baby Christian, you know, it was easier to get tempted to, to give in to this sin or that mm -hmm. sin as a baby Christian. But as you grow, see, the Bible talks about this process called sanctification. And the sanctification process, you get stronger. And it's not anything you're doing. It's actually the work of God. It's, it's His sovereign work in your life mm -hmm. to sanctify you. He bears fruit in our lives. Now, when I think about that, 
I think about how we get stronger in the Lord and our faith gets stronger. We're, we're, we're closer to him. We're being sanctified. And so the things that used to trip us up in the past, we are no longer getting tripped up by. And so the enemy has to change his tactics because he knows that he's not going to get me with the same temptations that I had as a baby Christian. So he now tries to hit me in a different place. Wow. Is this uh, kind of why you decided to make the film Higher Entities? Higher Entities, uh, it's a film that deals with a very much political, paranormal okay. conspiracy. Um, yes and no. I mean, I, I, we made Higher Entities for, for a lot of different reasons. Uh, the timing of Higher Entities could not have been better because we're dealing with a film that it digs deep into these areas of government alien entity connections. Now, why is that important? Because we're living in a time where we understand that the Antichrist is coming on the face of the earth. There will be an Antichrist. And we know that he has fallen angels that are going to be working with him. You know, he's going to have a demonic army. He's going to have all types of lying signs and wonders. The Bible talks about these lying signs and wonders. And if it were possible, the elect would be deceived by his cunning. So it's very interesting that we, that we see this. Now, granted, uh, I want to make a very quick statement here, if I can. A lot of people misuse that passage about you know, the elect being deceived. Mm -hmm. The elect are deceived in everyday life. There's, I mean, as a Christian, we get deceived. I, I, I get deceived sometimes. We can all be deceived as Christians, but that passage is referring to a specific time, specific place, dealing with your salvation versus the Antichrist. Now, when you consider that passage, if it were possible... That's how deceptive the Antichrist is going to be. He's going to be so deceptive that if it were possible, the elect would be deceived. Wow. Now, that's dealing with their salvation. At that time, the true elect of God who are filled with the Holy Spirit will not be deceived by him to the degree of their salvation. Now, they might be deceived by the Antichrist politically, uh, following after whatever it is he's pushing and selling, but there will come a time where their salvation is on the line and no, they will not be deceived according to Scripture. So do you see this as... Uh... The, like the end times event, uh, aliens coming down, uh, you know, declaring to be saviors of humanity, saying there's a cataclysm coming and we can save you, but you have to take the mark of the beast or something like that. I believe the aliens in the last days, which we don't really believe them to be space aliens, and, and we'll get into that here in a few minutes. But I believe that the alien entities, the higher entities, they will likely use some type of a cataclysmic event, something major, whether it's real or, or synthetic. You know, we know about Project Bluebeam. Mm -hmm. We know about technology where they they can project an image in the sky. Uh, they could simulate a false rapture, and the news could be used. Uh, we, I say we, my my team that I work with, West Fall, Chad Riley, uh, Fourth Watch Films, Fall Brothers Productions. We don't believe in a pre-trib rapture, and I want to lay this out there very clearly: the deception surrounding a pre-trib rapture. I believe will be used in this alien deception. They can synthesize a fake rapture. The news could promote it. Nobody could disprove it because all the channels, <clears throat> because all the channels of media are going to be promoting this idea, and they're going to have crisis actors. They're going to have footage. They're going to have possibly uh, CG being mixed in with real video. We don't know how that's going to go down, but there could be a fake rapture event where they they stage it so that people who are not firmly rooted in Christ. Maybe people who have heard the gospel, they've received the gospel, they think they're saved, but they're not really saved. There's no fruit in their life. There's no root that's taking place. Those people will fall away thinking that they've missed the rapture. That's scary stuff, man. Is that uh, maybe what Jesus was talking about when he said, uh, many will come to me on that day saying, Lord, Lord, and I'll say, back away from me, I never knew you? No, Jesus yeah. said that there, there, there's coming a time where they're going to say to him, Lord, Lord, I, you know, I did all this good stuff in your name. The thing that gets my attention there is that he, he mentioned some specifics like casting out demons mm -hmm. in your name. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, there's a major denomination right now that they make their, their big deal on casting out demons. There's a couple of them, actually. There's going to be people that think they're operating in spiritual gifts, yet Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. But what we're talking about with this, this alien idea, the aliens are going to be giving different types of experiences to people. This is what people have to understand. The experiences have to be tested with scripture mm -hmm. because other, otherwise we're going to accept them because they're supernatural experiences. 
whether it's a supernatural healing, whether it's some type of a prophetic event where they speak a word of knowledge or they know something about your, your history, whatever it may be, the aliens could have a cure for cancer. You know, the aliens. These higher entities are coming from a, a different place than us. They're not earthborn. The only ones that could be earthborn would be the demons, which came through the line of the Nephilim. And obviously that's a little bit of a different scenario. Mm-hmm. It ties in together. But with higher entities, we're dealing with, there is a group that we, we track in this film called the Collins Elite. Okay. And the idea was trying to answer the question, were there events in history where the American government was working with entities? That was kind of the beginning of this research. And if so, what happened? Can we, can we validate this? You know, what came of that? But also, were there factions in the government who stood up against these things? That was the premise of this film. Hmm. And uh, we started off by talking about a group known as the Collins Elite. Okay. Now, let's just go back in time. There was an event that took place back in the late 40s known as the Babylon Working Ritual. Now, this was a ritual that was carried out by Jack Parsons, uh, JPL. You know, People will even to this day say that JPL stands for, for Jack Parsons Laboratories. But on paper, it's Jet Propulsion Laboratories. JPL is major. It's a historic, I mean, so much surrounding this, so much history here. Uh, Jack Parsons was not professionally trained, yet he was tapping into high technology and building rockets. How do you do that without any type of formal training? Mm. There were no rocket programs in America before Jack Parsons. This is paramount to understand. This guy was tapping into you know, theosophy, Thelema, Thelema, the, the religion of Aleister Crowley. Uh, he was a disciple of Aleister Crowley, and he was working with uh, L. Ron Hubbard, who was the founder of Scientology. Interestingly, not only did L. Ron Hubbard uh, start Scientology, but he was a science fiction writer. Mm -hmm. Uh, The movie Battlefield Earth with John Travolta, well, that was written by L. Ron Hubbard. Interestingly, also, John Travolta is a Scientologist, right? Now, I mention this because this is a man who writes science fiction, yet he started a religion based on science fiction. There has to be something in there where he's getting these clues and these, these ideas. He's getting these from another realm. So do you believe that the Babylon working ritual made contact with uh, the other side and then the, the people involved with the ritual received special knowledge that would go on to uh, you know, create rocketry and stuff like that, high technology that they would never have um, without? Absolutely. Babylon working was successful according to Jack Parsons. Uh, matter of fact... Parsons said in his Antichrist Manifesto that they were successful and that a child, a child was conceived in that act and that there was a spirit known as Hilarion. The whore of Babylon was what they were trying to bring about. They believed what we believe in that America was the final Babylon. Like this was the revived Babylon. They believed it and they were occultists. You know, we're Christians and we believe it. There's evidence to back this up. But yes, uh, Let's backtrack just for a second. What happened was they opened up this portal. They created a rift and entities began to come through. Not just this horror of Babylon being birthed, but other entities because people all over the place started having paranormal encounters and they began to report this to law enforcement, report this to the the FBI, report this to whatever agency they could get in touch with. And so the federal agencies said, we've got to come up with an answer for this. You know, we were not prepared for any of this. There's UFO activity. There's, there's talk of entities and demons and winged creatures and just all kinds of weird, I mean, just paranormal demonic activity following this ritual that Jack Parsons said finally worked. They did the ritual for a couple years. It finally worked, finally stuck. And that's what a scientist does. Mm -hmm. A scientist is going to work at something. He's going to work at the hypothesis until it's, it's, you know, proven true or false. Now, finally, the researchers, the the government puts together this group that says, we're going to get answers to what exactly took place out there in the desert in California by Jack Parsons and L. Ron Hubbard. They go to Jack Parsons and keep in mind, Jack Parsons is also working with the government. He's now been given, you know, special privileges on things. So they go to him, they say, Jack, all of this stuff that's happening right now, did you do this? (laughs) Did you do this? And you know, he said, I think so. Now, shortly thereafter, Jack Parsons blows himself up in a lab. Accidental. It was not intentional. The occult belief was that whoever opened up the portal had to close the portal. Well, Jack Parsons is now dead. And the federal government is now having to understand and and depict exactly to the public what's happening here. 
And so this group is researching and out of that group, they finally start to make some headway. They know they're dealing with entities. And so in all of that, they begin to try to make contact with those entities, maybe for some help, maybe because they're trying to figure out how to close this thing. Maybe they're trying to figure out how to undo what Jack Parsons did. So they go through satanic rituals to communicate because that's the only method of communication that they know that works to contact these entities. In doing this, there's a small faction known as the Collins Elite. This is where our film picks up. The Collins Elite was a small group inside of this larger group that was originally created to get answers to all of this. But once they began to engage in satanic rituals and magic and alchemy, this group says, hey, you know what? This is, this is not what we signed up for. This small group raises up. It's a faction. It's a counterpoint group, which means that they are no longer in agreement with the big group. They have a different opinion. They say, we have a Christian worldview. This goes against our Christian worldview. And so they see that entities are being channeled and communicated with. And now technology is being given through these rituals to these other members of the government. So the Collins elite says, whoa, 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 this is dangerous. You guys are really playing with fire here. We can't support this. We can't do this. And they came up with this idea that the aliens were going to take over. And that in order to protect our country from the aliens, from the entities, they believed that we needed to instate a forced theocracy based on the law of Moses. Wow. Because they thought if our country would, would go back under the law of Moses, that we would be untouchable from these entities. Do they have any reasons to believe so? Uh, have you un uncovered anything that... Uh shows that they um, brought up the name of Jesus or anything like that? Or We've got nothing about that. Okay. Uh, matter of fact, uh, let, let me just give a little more detail here. Uh, this group, this bigger group that was researching to get answers, they did not exist. Okay, This was what's known as a limited access program or an LAP. Uh, a limited access program means that nobody in Congress has to know about this. Hmm. You've got wow. literally just the group and maybe a director knows about it. Nobody else. It's completely classified. It's top secret. It's, on, it's under lock and key. But I want to mention something. One of the bombshells that we dropped was that there's a declassified federal document. Anyone watching this interview can go find this document. It's on the FBI vault. What's the name of it? 6751. Okay. Uh, document 6751. It's a document from the 40s. It was written by a prominent member of academia, and it was submitted to the FBI. In this document... They make a case that entities are not space aliens, but that they're interdimensional or extra dimensional entities that are crossing over from a plane known as the ethereal plane. Wow. Now, we know uh, as, as researchers of the New Age movement, we know that that is where the ascended masters are supposedly said to be on mm -hmm. a high level. This ethereal plane is very popular well, You know, when you talk to people who astral project, people who channel, mm -hmm. people who remote view, people who want to tap in or go on a trip, an ayahuasca trip, a DMT trip. Yep. This is where they claim to go. Now, the federal government had this document in the 40s, and language was used in this document uh, that came right out of the playbook of theosophy. Now, the guy that received this document, this is so crazy. The, the federal agent receives a document, and look, the FBI is constantly bombarded with, with you know, phone calls and letters and emails, and you know, they just can't, they can't deal with all of the propaganda from, from citizens. You know, people make stuff up, and, and it's just, it, it's nothing. It's crying wolf. So the FBI has to really be careful what they accept and what they don't. But this was back in the 40s. Man. A little different back then than it is today. Absolutely. So the guy that receives a document, he recognizes that this information was received through paranormal means. As a matter of fact, the language used in the 40s was super normal. That's the old way of saying paranormal, super normal. So uh, he says that all of this information was received through super normal means. Therefore, we need to discount it. It's not valid information. Wow. Now, that's the headline that he put. It's like a cover letter. If he really believed that, why did they classify the document? Why did they classify it and then forward it to all of these FBI prominent members at the highest level of security clearance? Why in the world would they classify it and lock it up if they didn't believe it? It wasn't until years later that they declassified document 6751. And, and you know, I read this document and I'm thinking, okay, since the 40s, the federal government at the highest levels have known that these are not space aliens, that these are entities coming from another dimension. 
since the 40s. That's, Yet they've promoted an alien agenda. That's unbelievable. Um, so, in your opinion, do you believe that these entities that they uh, made contact with are the ones that are in Document 6571? Um, are they fallen angels? Um, or specifically, um, biblically, how can we equate that to um, our worldview? 6751 does not give specific um, classifications of entities per se. For instance, when you talk to someone who has worked in a deep underground military base, which we have, we've interviewed people, uh, they talk about different classes of entities. None of that is really mentioned in 6751. It's more so an overall summarization of what's going on. Now, there were some information about traveling through the dimensions. There's some very fascinating you know, tidbits in this document. Uh, and we, we don't really go too deep into the document other than referencing it in the film because we had to go through, you know, we've got over 300 declassified documents in our collection right now, all pertaining to aliens, UFOs, uh, extrasensory perception, psychic activity that they're training people to operate in. The federal government has been training people in the occult since the 40s, training them in how to operate in occult magic and occult sciences. Everything our Bible tells us is absolutely forbidden. Our federal government has been a part of this since the 40s. And I want to add, back in the 40s, they still promoted the idea of a Christian nation of America. Yet behind the scenes, it just goes to show that, our, that the people in charge of our government have been pacifying the society since the beginning. And I, I just, I don't understand how people could be so you know, so blinded. We present the information. This is what they said in the 40s, and it's only gotten worse over the years. Now, let me just draw us into this other area real fast. This group, the Collins Elite, they really wanted to create... How can I put this? They wanted to create some type of resistance. Non-aggressive, of course. Non-aggressive resistance. That's what I, I seem... I, I understand that from my studies. That's what I believe. They wanted a non-aggressive resistance to what was taking place because they saw that when a, when a man or a group of men began to communicate with these, these entities, the hunger for power gets greater and greater and greater. And then you're no longer trying to get answers. You're now wanting to ask them to give you blessings. You're now getting technology and information from these entities and you're utilizing it in the way that you structure your government moving forward. Wow. That's what's scary about governments working with entities. So do you believe that there was a power exchange? Uh, and do you believe that they're still working today with these entities? Oh, there was a power exchange. There, there were the, trading power for technology? Absolutely. And, and you would say, well, why, why would these entities need the government? It's not a matter of them needing the government. It's a matter of setting up the scene for the end times deception where the Antichrist is going to unite the governments of the world. It's all part of their long game. They've been working on this since the beginning of time. It didn't work at the Tower of Babel. The Lord ended it quickly. You know, but here we are today. Where are we today and, and what happened between then and now? Well, what we find out is that one of our contacts, Stan Deo, who, by the way, Tom Horn gave us a, a great uh, endorsement of Stan Deo. Tom Horn, before his house burned down uh, years ago, he had this, this big newspaper article from the UK. And standing on the cover uh, with these other elite doctors and scientists, it's Stan Deo. And they're giving him credit in the UK, public knowledge that he's working on anti-gravity craft. Wow. Now, the film that we did called The Hollow Earth Chronicles, we did a whole segment in that film on Operation High Jump. This was a joint task force between the Americans, uh, American government, the British government, and the Australian government, uh, headed by the US and, and Admiral Byrd. They go down to Antarctica and what turns into a UFO battle and their big plan got cut in half and they had to come home early because we lost men, we lost ships. Uh, there are stories of, of UFOs coming up out of the water and, and just cutting ships in half with laser. I mean, just crazy stuff that, that you only see in movies. What's fascinating about this is that this was a joint task force with those same three governments that are now working together with Stan Deo, the British, the American, and the Australians working together on alien technology yet again years after Operation High Jump happened. Wow. But so, uh, what were you going to say? Stan Deo was working as a secret agent for the FBI in Australia inside of the deep underground military bases. And he said while he was in the program, he knew about the deal with Eisenhower. He knew in the program that President Eisenhower had made a deal with what they called alien entities. 
So that's actually been a rumor now for a while, and uh, you believe that that is actually the case, that Eisenhower met with aliens, um, alien entities, and made some sort of arrangement with them? I believe that the evidence points to two events taking place, and these two events happened one year apart. Uh, the first one happened at Edwards Air Force Base, where Eisenhower disappears, and they call it a media blackout. It was kind of similar to when Hillary Clinton and President uh, Obama disappeared and were at the Bilderberg meeting, mm -hmm. but nobody knew where they were, and it was called a media blackout. Mm -hmm. People freaked out, right? Well, something similar happened here, where Eisenhower is no longer on radar and they come back later and say oh well he had a dental emergency and so he had to go seek a private dental you know dental care now that happened and then a year later we have the holloman air force base event now the thing about the holloman event was that people were there who witnessed it holloman is where they were out on the landing strip and you had ufos landing meeting with him a meeting took place with eisenhower and others and then those ufos took off now there were eyewitnesses who have come forward uh, I was just talking about this with Chad Riley because he found some videotapes from the 90s. This is before the internet was, was you know, doing its thing. In the 90s, there were videos that were recorded, you know, old VHS tapes of some of these uh, disclosure type engagements. I don't know what you want to call it, but these are men that were there. They were, they're, they're decorated wow. men from the government, and they're now speaking out that, yes, UFOs were landing and taking off at Holloman Air Force Base, and I believe it was 1955. Wow. I don't have the month uh, right now. Um, so 1955 and then uh, the Babylon working was what year? Late 40s. Okay, so now that happened. A, a correlation in the two events? Well, we do know that things began to be more apparent after Babylon working. Therefore, there were more uh, things taking place where there was people seeking the entity. So what I believe happened was that the uh, the rift was open, you know, the, the tear in the space-time continuum, if you will, a portal, Stargate was opened. And... The government got involved, the feds got involved. Once they began to communicate with the entities, there was now a relationship being built and it was no longer shock value that there are these entities who want to work with us. So I think that that was definitely an open door, no pun intended, for those entities to now be communicating with President Eisenhower years later, not too many years later, but a few years later, they're now meeting with Eisenhower. Uh, and so the story goes like this. We're on the road trip. We're driving out to meet with Ray Boucher, who was contacted by the Department of Defense. This is really important. This is, I mean, this is one of those like haymakers. The information that he gives us that we, you know, he presented his full disclosure in our film, Higher Entities. But we're driving there. We're having a discussion. And we decided, let's just go ahead and let, let's, let's run some cameras, you know, while we're driving and, and, and talking. So we set up, you know, we set up our production stuff in, in, uh, in Darren's SUV. We're driving down the road and we have this conversation about this Eisenhower deal. See, what I had heard and researched was a little different than what Darren had picked up in his research. And this is one of those, those scenes in the movie where it's just like, wow, like the stuff that came out was so organic and unbelievable. Apparently, there were two events that happened, and a lot of people blur them. A lot of people will mix it up uh, with the Edwards Air Force Base and the Holloman. They're two separate events a year apart. That's so important. But the idea was is that the gray aliens on record, met with Eisenhower. And then you had this other group of entities known as like the Tall Whites or the Nordics. They met with Eisenhower separately and they warned him. They said, you do not ever want to make a deal with the gray aliens. They are deceptive. They are very deceptive. All they want to do is deceive you and enslave you. Wow. They're demonic, basically. They didn't, I don't think they use the word demonic, right? Because they're all demonic. But <laughs> they were warning Eisenhower never to enter into a covenant with the Greys. Well, they were the good guys, the Greys were the bad guys. This is fascinating because if you fast forward into this idea of a coming deception, they had to already set the groundwork to create a good alien, bad alien, wow. good cop, bad cop. And that actually kind of fits along with the new age belief of uh, like the Galactic Federation of Light. Right. The light workers. Um, and they kind of all believe that um, there are these higher entities that want the best for humanity and they are our saviors. Uh, but they call themselves the Galactic Federation of Light or something like that. And they're like... That's the term, by the way. That is the term. Okay. Uh, and, and did they... Uh, do you believe that th that was a group that meant, uh, <laughs> made contact with Eisenhower? It's tough to say because what we're dealing with here is a bunch of liars. Okay. You know, Satan's a liar. His demons are liars. Uh, that's why when someone starts playing with a Ouija board... Mm -hmm. 
their grandmother starts talking to them. Well, it's not your grandmother, bro. Yeah. That's a demon. Yeah. That's an entity who wants to deceive you. Sure. They want to, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's biblical. And we're also told as Christians, we've got to be vigilant and we've got to be sober-minded because Satan is our adversary. And the word Satan, the name Satan isn't really a name. We, you know, we have this misconception that Satan, you know, the devil, the red pitchfork. And in reality, you know, Hasatan is the enemy, the adversary. Mm. And so when we say Satan, it could actually be referring to the whole, the whole class, team yeah. of demons and entities, fallen angels. Uh, and so what we have is we have the fallen angels. And now it's my personal belief. Let me just lay this out real quick. It's my personal belief based on the book of Revelation and based on me using a calculator and understanding some definitions, I was able to calculate that if a third of the angels fell with Lucifer, with Satan, if a third, the Satan, right? Mm -hmm. If a third of them fell with him, and that's also based on another passage of a third of the stars uh, getting knocked down to earth. Um, if that passage means what we think it means, and if we understand it correctly, a third of the angels fell with Satan. And you can do your math and figure out that that equals somewhere between 30 to 50 plus million fallen angels on the surface of the earth. Now, out of that, some of them were put in chains. The Bible tells us this because some the ones that committed sexual sin, uh, the Genesis 6, mm -hmm. uh, they have been locked up in chains. We can read about this in Jude. Uh, but the ones that are not locked in chains, just think about it, 30 to 50 plus million fallen angels on the face of the earth. That's like that's, uh, I made the comment recently in an interview I did that that is more than the population of the largest state in America. So, wow, so we are dealing with a, a large group of entities who um, have the capabilities not only to deceive mankind, but to um, kind of guide them in the direction that they want to go. Um, I mean, it seems like, from everything you just said, it seems like that they are setting up um, for the final great deception. Um, so let's track back to um, the Collins elite a little bit. So what sure. happened to them? Did they... Um, I mean, they obviously saw something was going wrong, right? So did they disappear? Are they still around, do you think? Well, we have to remember that uh, the original group that they were a part of was a, an LAP, Limited Access mm -hmm. Program. And so that means that they don't exist. So what happened was uh, by the time we got involved in the research, and my research for the Collins Elite only goes back about three or four years. So like I'm not, I'm not Mr. Uh, yeah, I wasn't around back in the 40s, you know, when all this was, was getting started. Uh, but what we did was we started, we, we wanted to, to really, in order to validate the Collins Elite's existence, we also needed to find out were there other groups like this through the years? Because if, if it's going on here, it's probably going on over here and over here, right? Mm -hmm. You, you want to be able to, to confirm with more witnesses than just an eyewitness of one group. So that's part of what we did in the film Higher Entities was we wanted to show that there are other groups, other people who have had experiences in the government. Uh, and, and by the way, Tom Horn, his brother-in-law was murdered. He worked at Los Alamos. Wow. This was the first time he ever told the story publicly. He never spoke this story publicly. Matter of fact, he told his sister that he would not disclose the full story while she was still alive. Yet here he is. He worked it out to tell us the story in our film. His brother-in-law worked for Los Alamos. And interestingly, he married his Tom's sister, who had alien encounters from the time she was about 13 years old, uh, as soon as she started uh, entering into puberty. And there's something about, uh, about a child entering into puberty that's attractive to the demonic world. I don't understand that 100%. But regardless, not only did she suffer uh, alien visitations and paralysis uh, as a child, her daughter... The next generation, when she entered into that age of puberty, she began to get attacked. And then her husband, this is where it gets crazy. He comes home one day. They start drinking, you know, knocking back a few. One thing leads to another, which I found out a lot of times when people start drinking, it, they're able to pull things out of the recesses that they would never talk about. So many stories of, of alien abductions and demonic activity people are willing to talk about after they have a few drinks. Things that are in those deep recesses come out. Now, I'm not saying that to recommend or to, to, you know, I'm just saying that a lot of the stories we find out about in our research comes from one guy having a few drinks and then just it just starts coming out. Wow. It's like the filter's gone. Wow. Long story short, and, and we give the full story in higher entities. It's a great story. Uh, I mean, not great as in good, but it's very fascinating. Um, he comes home, they, he and the wife start drinking, and uh, she decides she's going to share some of her childhood history with him that he didn't know about. And if I remember correctly how it all went down, he comes out and says, well, this is crazy because we're actually working with this type of stuff 
at Los Alamos. Now he gives her information that we don't know, but he disclosed to her what he was doing in the alien base that the conspiracy theorists call an alien base. Uh, but now it doesn't really seem like a conspiracy theory anymore because if it was just a theory, why would he have been killed 24 hours later? 24 hours after he shares what they were doing at Los Alamos, he disappears, no body found, nothing. They say that they've never seen him back in the offices, you know. Uh, so she reaches out and she's like, where's my, you know, my husband never came home from work. He left for work. He left our house. He drove, you know, he went to Los Alamos, but he never came home. Well, she now wants to get her benefits just to help pay for, you know, for all the expenses that he was, you know, he was bringing in money. He's no longer there and he's been working hard. You know, there's pension and guarantees that, that she's supposed to get. They won't give her anything because there's no body. Without a body, there's no death certificate. Without a death certificate, there's no benefits. So she, working for the federal government as well, she starts rattling the cage high up. And finally, once she starts dropping information that's putting fear in people, they, in order to shut her up, finally say, okay, you know what? Here you go. Here's your benefits. Done. Wow. Now, that tells me that it's not a conspiracy theory. That there's actual fact to this, that there's alien activity, demonic activity going on at Los Alamos, and it was so serious that they would have had his house bugged, wow. and that they were tracking every discussion he had in that house. So, Los Alamos is home to America's nuclear program, correct? I don't know all, I, I, I can't speak on that, to be honest with okay. you. Okay, um, have you uncovered any um, connections between like the first nukes and um, alien entity contacts? There is a, a part of the Hollowworth film that we, where we talk about this. We talk about uh, Admiral Byrd, this crazy story of him going down into the Hollow Earth, being taken down by UFOs uh, with swastikas uh, or the Iron Cross. I forget what was on the, the UFOs, but he gets taken down. Uh, he loses all control of his plane. He's taken down inside the Earth, and he, he, he gets uh, to meet with this uh, entity known as the Master. Matter of fact, in the Hollow Earth Chronicles film, we do an entire... Uh, uh, dramatized version of Admiral Byrd's diary. And so whether or not the diary was written by Byrd or it was written by a family member who, who was, you know, retaining all of those secrets, uh, we don't know. But what we do know is that the master was warning Admiral Byrd that when he comes back onto the surface that he needed to bring a message to our government. And that message was stop playing with nukes. Wow. That's, that's really interesting because um, what you just talked about um, with... Tom Horton's family. Uh, him going, working at Los Alamos and then disappearing like that, uh, there have been rumors of deep underground military bases in Los Alamos or around Dulce. Oh, it is. It is. And that was the thing was he was working in the Dom, the deep underground military base. From my understanding, he was working there and he told her what he was working on. Wow. We don't even know what that was. That's what's so fascinating about this story is that we don't even know what he disclosed, but it was something so serious that 24 hours later, he's dead. Wow. Uh, do you think there's any connection between Roswell event and all of this stuff? I think the Roswell event uh, definitely was, again, we're dealing with the fallout of what took place at the Babylon working. Babylon working changed everything. I believe that was uh, prophetic on the satanic timeline. That was a big deal. And so I do believe for a fact that Roswell was just another byproduct. And I also believe based on another FBI document that we have in our stack of over 300 is that uh, there were more than one craft. And I believe, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I want to say there was possibly nine bodies according to one declassified document. Wow. I don't want to misquote that, but I want to go on record to say that there there was something wow. to do with, I think, three craft and possibly nine bodies, according to one document. So is, do you think this is where uh, they get the physical um, technology that they kind of uh, reverse engineer and bring the entities, these entities like from Roswell, for instance, down into the deep underground military bases? Or is that just a, a whole separate event where the, uh, the Roswell entities were... Um, came, came, kind of came through here by accident and the whole thing was just happenstance. It's actually a really good question. This is going to lead us right into Ray Boucher. Ray Boucher is now bringing all of this current. You know, we're no longer dealing with 1940s or 50s or 60s. We're dealing with, you know, our lifetime and, and, and it, this is where it just hits home. Ray Boucher is, uh, is an ordained minister. He has uh, been a Baptist minister, a Lutheran minister, and he's also known as a Lutheran exorcist. 
um, we're very particular about who we work with and who we yoke up with in ministry. And uh, after talking with Ray and looking into him, he is extremely biblically sound. His theology is right in line with scripture on all the majors that would, would matter. And so we, we did some homework on this guy, Tom Horn, Derek Gilbert, um, goodness, everybody that we talked to, people that I'm not even going to name, people that we talked to off the record, everybody kept saying, including Darren Geisinger and uh, Chad Riley, they all said, you got to talk to Ray Boucher. They said he was met with by two members of the Department of Defense uh, because of his unique background as a minister, as an exorcist, and as the head of MUFON for his state, uh, which is Nebraska. Wow. This is a guy who was heavily involved in the UFO community uh, back before the internet was a thing. He would go to these meetings. He would read up. I mean, back then it was like like a videotape was like sixty dollars, like a documentary videotape. You pay sixty. Yeah. I mean, these were the days before the internet, before YouTube. Uh, information was harder to get. But Ray Boucher was heavily involved in the UFO community back in the day. And so being the head of MUFON and also uh, for his state and also for being a, a minister and an exorcist and a UFO advocate, you know, a UFO truth advocate, uh, these two men contact him from the DOD. And they say, we really need to meet with you because of your unique standing. We need to meet with you and we need your, uh, basically we need you to consult with us about what some of this may be. So he met secretly with these members of the Department of Defense, and they told him that they were part of a non-existent group inside the DOD working on government facilities paid for by taxpayer dollars, and that they began to try to get answers to some of this stuff, and they began to engage in occult rituals to communicate with these entities. Now, now let me explain this. If you don't feel like this is just a reoccurrence of, of, of the Collins elite, <laughs> I mean, this is, but this is recent. This, this is happening in the modern time period. Um, he says that their bigger group was, was engaging in, in what he called satanic rituals. And he even said that the DOD contacts hinted at human sacrifice being done on the taxpayer dollar behind closed doors on government facilities. He said they started off with, we just want to get answers. And he says, and that turned into a we can do better mentality. We can do more than this. We can go above and beyond. This is the same story you see when you're watching movies about famous drug dealers. Oh, we can do better mentality. Starts off, they're just selling a little dope. And before you know it, they're a kingpin and they just want more and more and more. It's not that they need it anymore, but it's that we can do better mentality. We can't leave well enough alone. To quote Karate Kid, we cannot leave well enough alone and we can do better and we're going to do better and we're going to get more technology, we're going to get more information, we're going to get more power and we're going to rise up by the power of the entities. And so Ray Boucher explained to them that yes, this stuff was extremely demonic. That yes, you guys, y'all had a good idea. Basically, your instincts were correct. This is demonic and you don't need to be doing it. Uh, they knew that was the case, but they needed someone they could talk to, such as Ray Boucher with his unique background. And so he was able to, to meet with them. And I believe they met twice. They had some phone conversations. But the thing is, is Ray wouldn't meet with us originally. He didn't want to talk to anybody. He, he's a very friendly guy. He, you know, he, he was willing to just be cordial and hello, you know, nice to meet you. But when we told him we wanted him on camera and that we wanted to meet with him, it was like, well... I could probably work with you guys at some point, he says, but I'm really busy. It's kind of like the nice way of saying, sorry, can't help you. Uh, we continued to, to try to reach out to him. Uh, we began our investigation. We talked with Tom Horn and Derek Gilbert and these others. Derek Gilbert told us to go listen to an interview he did uh, with a podcast. Uh, Dr. Future, I think, was the name of the show. And we listened to it. And at the very beginning of the podcast, the guy says, wow, we've been trying to schedule this with you for over a year and you're finally coming on to talk with us. So I imagine Ray Boucher is extremely careful. He's very standoffish. He wants to protect his family. He doesn't want to get involved in something he shouldn't be. And so I, 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 I just kind of wrote it off that he's not going to meet with us. And we're probably going to have to just go ahead and end this, uh, this project early. He finally comes through and says, okay, I'll do it. But... I'm not going to tell you where we're going to meet or what time we're going to meet. He says, plan on coming down and getting a hotel in the big city close by. So we did. We went down. We got a hotel in the, in the big city. Uh, and it was a big city, by the way. This, this city was booming and busy. I mean, crazy busy the whole time we were there. Uh, we didn't know until the morning of what time we were going to meet and the fact that he was going to come to us at our hotel room. 
That's how secretive he is. Wow. wow. And just to add a little bit of uh, mystery to the situation, shortly after we got done releasing this, this film, uh, I get word that Ray Boucher has been diagnosed with some strange, rare kind of cancer. Wow. Man. And so I say that to ask people to be praying for him. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, well, we know that um, historically, UFO researchers and whistleblowers always, uh, not always, but a lot of times they'll um, come up with this rare form of cancer that's fast acting, dead within weeks. Um, they also have heart attack guns and stuff like that. Um, and typically, you know, this is what, this is the fate that, you know, that these people had because they uh, were trusted with some top secret information and uh, decided that the public interest was more important. Let me add to that. that that's a great point. Uh, one of the uh, bonus nuggets that we released in higher entities was there was a, a guy who had very high security clearance. I believe it was a lieutenant colonel. I forget. Chad Riley knows. It, it was his contact. It wasn't our contact. And by the way, let me just give a quick shout out to Chad Riley. He's the guy who fishes, he fishes up these documents that nobody's ever heard of. Nice. Like we are blessed to have, people are like, how do you even get some of this information? Well, we've got a guy on our team named Chad Riley and he has a skill to where he fishes up these rare documents from the FBI vault that nobody's ever heard of. And That's so amazing. it's a blessing to have him on board and he's also our co-producer. So having Chad on board, uh, cause somebody's gonna wonder, how, how did you find document 6751? It, it was downloaded. You can only download it like if you don't know how to find it, you got to download it in a thick packet called the UFO packet number one, uh, which, by the way, is available on the, the FBI vault. The same FBI vault where they admitted that Hitler was alive in Argentina after World War II. Yep. People ask where we got that document that we showed in the Hollow Earth Chronicles. Well, we got it from the FBI. While I was doing a, an interview with Gon Shimura on Face Like the Sun YouTube channel, he goes to pull up the document. His IP address is blocked from accessing that document. He had to go in and change his settings live on the recording that we did. He had to change his browser settings just to access 6751. Now, I don't wanna digress. I'm a nugget dropper. I drop nuggets everywhere. Everybody loves these nugs. <laughs> I do too. But here's the thing, this is so important. Um, we're dealing with this idea of government agencies doing anything it takes to keep you from getting the Easter egg. Mm -hmm. That's what it is. They're trying to hide their Easter eggs. And so what happened here was uh, Chad's contact, his name is Greg Renrich. He has the, the above top secret clearance, uh, areas such as Groom Lake, Area 51, uh, a list. Chad breaks down the whole list in higher entities. And so Chad was in contact with him through our other mutual contact, Kay Carswell, who's a dear friend of ours. Kay has become friends with Greg Renrich. They've interviewed him. Uh, I don't know if they've interviewed him publicly or just private, but uh, he started to give Chad all this information that we were going to include in our film. And so the information was unbelievable, and, I, and I'll give that information away here in a second. But I want to just say he was supposed to be in our film. At some point, he just decides he's going to just fall off the face of the earth and back out. And so we're trying to get answers, like what's going on with Greg Renrich? I mean, he was a prime interview. We needed him. This guy has been down in the underground bases with the entities. Wow. See, Stan Deo didn't work directly with entities. His colleagues worked with the entities. Wow. So Stan's was hearsay, trustworthy hearsay, but he didn't work with the entities. This guy, Greg Renrich, worked in the base with entities that called themselves the Nephilim. They were nine, ten feet tall entities, and they told him that they were preparing for an intergalactic war with God. And that they were going to win. They believed they were going to win. Furthermore, Greg Renrich is on record saying that he had to sign an affidavit before he could go in this facility. That he wouldn't even use the name Jesus, even as a cuss word, in this deep underground military base. And this goes right back to what Joe Jordan says, is that all, hundreds of cases of alien abduction uh, completely halted at the name of Jesus being proclaimed. So that's, you can't even say the name of Jesus in these deep underground military bases. No, and he, well, I don't know about all of them, but the one that Greg Renrich, the, 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 the various bases that Renrich uh, worked in with his clearance, at least one of those bases, he had to sign an affidavit that he would not use the name of Jesus, even if he stubbed his toe as a cuss word, he couldn't say Jesus. Wow. So what we have here is uh, they have their army, 
And we as Christians, we know how this all ends, right? We know Jesus is going to come back and we know that he's going to throw all these uh, demonic entities into the bottomless pit. Um, they're not going to win. But no. Why do they think they can win? Is there, do you, have you uh, come up with any you know, ideas to what makes them think this way? Because we know that the gospel of the Bible is 100% truth and it's incorruptible. It's kind of a, a loaded answer because obviously I, I don't know the mind of a demon 100%, but it's kind of a similar, uh, it's kind of similar to what the Freemasons believe. When you work your way up into Freemasonry, uh, you believe that it's compatible with your faith. And in reality, it's really not compatible with anyone's faith. It's its own faith. Uh, but you don't know that at the lower levels. You know, it's a universalist group. You know, when you, when you take that first initiation, you are agreeing that all paths lead to the great architect. You know, what they call God, the eye of providence. Um, as you work your way up, I think it's the 28th degree, somewhere between the 28th and the 30th, if I remember correctly. I just had this conversation the other night with my buddy Brett. And you have this understanding that the Bible is good and it's the word of God. But when you get to the 28th to the 30th degree, you find out that the role gets reversed and that Lucifer was actually the underdog. He was the good God that, that really did all the good creation that really did. He had the best uh, he, had, he had basically our best interest in, at heart in so everything he did. Gnosticism. It's Gnosticism. And so Jesus, they believe, is the enemy. Yahweh is the enemy. That it's a reversal role. That the Bible, and this is part of the coded language that they use, is that you don't find this out until you're higher up. So it's like the, the, the reversing of roles. So even though Jesus has already uh, died on the cross, he shed his blood on Calvary. And there's some really interesting things about his blood possibly going down to the Ark of the Covenant. And, uh, it, maybe another video we could talk about that. Uh, but Jesus died on Calvary. He, was, he descended into the heart of the earth where he preached to the spirits in prison. This is all part of the hollow earth film we did. And then he rose. He defeated death. He rose from the dead. And he declared victory over every unclean spirit, over every imp of Satan, over every evil entity that would ever be in existence. He literally declared victory over. And their time is short. They know their time is short. Yet their goal is to try to do as much damage to the kingdom as they can. But what we know, according to scripture, is that their, you know, their work is in vain yeah. because the cross defeated all of that. Now, let me add one last little thing here. Greg Rimrich uh, was out walking on his ranch, here, his farm, his property, with his wife. And all of a sudden, they, they get this thing on the back of their neck, and they're kind of, you know, wiping it. You know, you, you ever, like, you know, smash a bug or something, and you kind of, like, do one of these? So um, they get a slimy residue on the back of their neck. Well, it doesn't affect him the same way it affects his wife. And this is their property. This isn't like they're out in some random wooded lot. This is their land. They get back... And they've already had a horrible history. Ever since he started speaking out about his testimony, because he's a Christian, uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, he began to share these stories publicly. And uh, he had just a SWAT team show up at his house with machine guns, uh, destroyed his family. Uh, his, his, the family relationships that they had tight bonds with are now, they've got a broken family over all this. Uh, people can't understand why he would have done anything to put their family at risk. You know, they're like, why would you have done this? You know, why would you even talk about this? You have ruined this family. And so he doesn't even have good relationships with all of his family anymore because of the, the high up non-existent government, uh, you know, SWAT teams that are coming out to force him into submission. Anyway, that happened previously. Now, fast forward, they're walking on their land and they get this slimy residue on the back of their neck. And so they get back home and the wife is ill. I mean, it, it acted fast. So ill. Uh, Chad gave us an update. You know, Chad contacted him, and we, we filmed the update in the film because we were waiting on him. You know, we were kind of tracking along. He's not going to come on the film. His wife's not doing well. Matter of fact, uh, Chad said in the film that uh, he didn't know his wife was actually going to make it through all of this. And it reminded me of, a, of the late J.C. Johnson who was a friend of mine, he was a cryptozoologist and he would take people on guided tours in the Four Corners area where he would show people where the these animals would show up. Like he, he says that they've seen pterodactyls. He says they've seen all kinds of crazy, uh, what we could only call a hybrid or a prehistoric type. You know, and I don't believe in prehistoric time, but uh, the idea of what we're told dinosaurs are, uh, these strange animals, right? Uh, we're told that there's, there's portals in the Four Corners where these things cross over and the Indians don't want to go near it. 
And these wild animals, what we would call animals, they're, they're these weird things that are coming through the portals. So J.C. Johnson would go out there with his, you know, he'd take a, a security team with, you know, with machine guns, uh, like mercenary style, and they would, take, they would give guided tours out there. Uh, people that wanted to go see this for themselves. And it was uh, several times he would send me photos from their action cameras where they would pick up what looks like gray aliens in the bushes. Wow. Anyway, I'm bringing all this up because J.C. Johnson told me that he had friends that went down to Dulce to research. He said that they were getting a little too close to the fire. They got done doing their homework. They go back to their car. Well, what they didn't know is that before they got back to their car, there were men in black, these men in the shadows, that came and dusted some type of a biological weapon known as a transdermal on the handles of their car. So all they had to do was touch the handle. You, you touch it, it is now transdermal. It's going into your bloodstream immediately. Uh, and they become either really, really ill to the point where the rest of their life is spent in a bed or they die. That's what I was reminded of when Greg Renrich you know, passed on the message that his wife was ill and that they had found some type of a slime on the back of their necks. Wow. Are you personally worried about any uh, government intervention on your part? You know, I um, I don't want to lose my life because I've got so much love to give and I got so much uh, you know kingdom work to do. But I'm reminded of this passage in the Bible, and I don't have the the address in my mind. I don't know where it is in the Bible, but there's a passage that talks about you know don't fear those that can kill the body. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to fear the one that owns your soul, the one that can take your soul. And that is the Almighty God. That is, that is you know, Yahweh, Jehovah, Jesus Christ. Uh, he's the only one that I fear. And so if someone were to take this body because of me doing a service to the kingdom, it just means more crowns and riches in Amen. the next life. Amen. We've been talking tonight about our latest film, Higher Entities, The Lost Tapes. Uh, you can find this film and our other films at fourthwatchfilms.com. That's F-O-U-R-T-H-W-A-T-C-H-F-I-L-M-S dot com. Fourth Watch Films, all spelled out. Head over there and you can get the instant on-demand stream of both of our films, or you can get the DVDs. And currently we are running a promo, uh, a double feature. You can get the double feature right now for 20% off at fourthwatchfilms.com.